Hey guys, welcome to the Evan and Caitlin podcast, the podcast that is in its 23rd week without an intro we feel good about. It's okay. <laughs> I guess that proves the point. I guess that proves the point. We're struggling uh, to come up with things to say after the show. The show that, you know? Yeah, well, didn't we like abandon it for a while? We did abandon it for a while. Or uh, you would just like randomly start recording when I was still on my phone. Yeah, that was it. I got that it a few times. That was the new series. Yeah. Evan records before Caitlin's ready. Well, welcome everyone. Hopefully there are a few new people here because we're going to try to push this to a broader audience because we have been getting like the request to make this episode from a, for a long time mm-hmm. and we have a lot of things to say here. We do. We do. So much that we've given a couple talks on it already yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at events and such. So Yeah, well, if you're new, welcome. Hello, I'm Evan. I'm Caitlin. <laughs> I, I guess that was kind of obvious. We make videos on YouTube. We have our main channel where we do a lot of making. We have a gaming channel. We have this podcast channel. And who knows, we might start another channel one day. Don't commit to anything. <laughs> Who, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> the, the possibilities are endless. <laughs> so for our regular listeners, this podcast is going to be a little bit different. We are going to be going kind of like really in depth into one subject. It's probably going to be a longer podcast and we probably won't have time for a game on this one. No story times. No like topics. Just get ready no to be Q&As. disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Get super excited because this is something that we talk about all the time. The two of us. So much. This is most of what we talk about. <laughs> it's, it's a lot. It's in our heads a lot. We also talk about it all the time to all of our friends that we've made in this space. I mean, we if probably see our fellow... If you talk to any YouTuber, they probably talk about this a yeah. lot. <laughs> we've, we've probably seen our fellow content creators more than most of our other friends <laughs> recently <laughs> just because we've like divin, dove so deep into this world. So we are going to be sharing like how to start your YouTube channel. There's a lot of tips that we've picked up, how to grow your YouTube channel, and then how to monetize. Yeah, so this should be a three-part series. Are we breaking this into three parts? No, no, it's all one episode. Oh, it is? Yeah, it's, it's, it's just oh. one long episode. Oh, gosh, okay. I thought this was a three-part Get, a, get excited, Caitlin. I'm excited. <laughs> okay, I have, I have my water. I'm prepared. I have my... Oh, I don't have my chapstick. It's not in reach. Uh-oh. <laughs> we can take a break midway through. Okay, chapstick break. Okay, I'm already, I'm already feeling chipped. <laughs> But, but also, like, going more in depth into, uh, like, overview of what we're going to be talking about. We're mm-hmm. going to, like, go over how to decide what content to make mm-hmm. at, at the very beginning. Because I feel like a lot of people jump to how to grow. Yeah, but there's all these foundational things that I feel like you need to figure out before you can start implementing strategies to grow. Because the strategies are not the same across the board. and yeah, they're completely dependent on, like, what you're making and... That, like, once you know what you're making and your approach to YouTube, that will guide everything else. Like, what Mm -hmm. equipment you get, what schedule you need to keep, like... um, How you promote your videos and where you promote your videos and should you promote your videos. Where your communities are. It's like, Mm -hmm. that is the foundation upon which you will build your entire career if you you turn this into a career. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Or you could just be doing this for fun. We can cover that too. Mm -hmm. Um, But, like, that's the most important part and that's what we put so much of our thought into, even now. Yeah. You know, and we're continually like shifting and adjusting that like base upon which we're standing. Yeah. And then we're going to go into tips for making the content itself. Yep. Some tips for making the content. Some some tips also for the actual launch of your channel because that's another thing we put a lot of time and thought into was the strategies behind that. Um, and then we'll get into growth yeah. and how to grow it, which is probably the part we get asked most about. Yeah. But then also, like, if you're going to turn this into a career, you have to have some sort of a strategy on how to monetize. And there mm-hmm. are plenty of ways to monetize. And, and probably the best is to do all of them. <laughs> well, I mean, I would say try all of them. Try, try all of them. Maybe don't do all of them. <laughs> try all of them. See what works best for you and your audience. And, and try go, going into monetization Fairly early, I think. Oh, we'll get into we'll that get later. Into we'll that. get into that yeah. later. Yeah. That's yeah. part three. I mean, that's, well, not part, part three. three of this of podcast. This, of this episode. Okay. Okay. Stretch it out. Stretch it out. Prepare yourself. All right. So I think that, like, why we want to give this talk in particular is because um, we started our channel with intent to make it a business. We wanted to, like, work together. Mm-hmm. We wanted to be together. So from the beginning, we put these strategies into place. Yeah. And I think, like, if you, talk to a lot of different channels, especially people who today are 
successful back when they started it a, a lot of people just started it kind of for fun or just as a hobby and you know back then being a full-time YouTuber wasn't as common of a career so a lot of people didn't have that in mind and so sometimes the sometimes people did have strategies for growth but sometimes it just kind of they fell into it mm -hmm. you, you know yeah not that they weren't working hard to work on their channel but it it might not have been the immediate priority from day one and or, i think those yeah. like immediate strategies are the hardest to figure out because once you have growth you, you know it's it you have that fuels. momentum yeah, yeah it self fuels mm. um so because we started from that zero subscriber mark with making it a business mm. in mind I think we have some good strategies for other people that are starting at that beginner mark. Yeah, and, and on, on the topic of monetization, we went full-time by 80K subscribers on YouTube. Yeah, there's and two people quitting yeah, their jobs. Two people <laughs> quitting their jobs, and our bank account didn't, like, suffer tremendously. You know, yeah. and it wasn't a bad decision, because I know some people just, like, trust that they're going to be caught by the community and trust that they'll grow in the future. But we were able to go full-time at 80K. Without too much risk. Without too much risk. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to kind of dive into that. And we're going to keep all of these tips as broad as possible so that no matter what type of channel you are, if you, you know, are make your, ma make your, <laughs> make your channel. <laughs> if you're a maker channel like us, or if you're going into like beauty or gaming or whatever, whatever you're most excited about, it should be applicable for all of those different types of channels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what type of content are you going to make? The most important thing of this entire talk. Go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, me? Now? Yeah, yeah. Oh, God. Um, okay, so I, when we're thinking about what types of content you can choose to make from, are you looking at me really close? I just saw you in the, like, <laughs> yes, in the I camera. Was. Sorry for anyone just listening to the audio of this. <laughs> yes, Evan's being weird. Um, so, so when we think about where your content can fall and what type of content to make, we almost kind of picture it in like a... Uh, two by two matrix. Yeah. On one end, you have educational content versus entertainment content, and all you know the varying mixed percentages in between. Yeah. On the other axis, you have broad content versus niche content, mm -hmm. and you know the variations in between. And I, I think that giving some examples of each would be kind of useful. So yes. entertainment that might be comedy or video games or vlogs or beauty. They're primarily like shared and enjoyed in different like ways as opposed to edu education. People <laughs> my, watch it for fun. Yeah. My words are good. <laughs> yeah. Your words are really good. Whereas education would be like uh 3d modeling tutorials or how to boil an egg or how to sew on a button. Well, but those are very specific things in general, like science video essays and DIY type of contents are like well, the general categories of, I don't feel like you can just say that that's education. Cause a lot of the science and DIY and video essays I think of are more entertainment than education. Mm -hmm. True. True. But, well, broad and niche content. This is an easier okay, thing okay, to okay. classify. <laughs> we, I think we can agree on this. So like, Making and DIY are like a broader category, but like within that, you can go into woodworking or metalworking or welding. Or within that, you could, um, instead of just doing woodworking, you could do hand tools only. Yeah. So you can yeah. kind of like keep on focusing it down or on the more like general categories, you can do vlogging, but then within that, there's niches of travel vlogging. And within that, there's niches of travel vlogging in foreign countries. And within that, there's like, you travel know. Travel vlogging in foreign countries with kids. Yeah. So there's yeah. like, you can kind of niche down again and again and again even within comedy you can have like comedy or you can have skit comedy and or you can have like video game themed skit comedy yeah. <laughs> and like where you start the channel is really really important because mm -hmm. it's painful and difficult to change later on yeah it's not impossible because we it's it's not it, impossible but, <laughs> but there's growing pains yes and there's advantages to all four of these like quadrants mm -hmm. you know so with entertainment i think that you have probably one of the broadest audiences. Yeah, so like the compared, highest growth ceiling, I would say. The highest say. growth ceiling. And with education, a lot of people seem to want to watch education videos, but they just don't in total get viewed as much. Unless they have a heavy dose of entertainment. Yes, yes. So yeah. it's like, again, on that spectrum. And with broad content, I think it's great because it allows you a lot of flexibility. Mm -hmm. You know, like, um, especially like if, if 
like you know YouTube, the YouTube landscape changes because mm-hmm. like if you started a Minecraft video game channel a while ago, you might have found like really good growth and success. But then if Minecraft fades in popularity or gains popularity, then you're going to struggle to change. Yeah. You know? But if you had a general gaming channel, then you could grow. And same with any of these different topics. Yeah. And I will go back a little bit. On one thing you said earlier is that like education videos don't get watched as much. And I, I think like in total, they probably might. Mm-hmm. You know, because like that is still a huge reason people go to YouTube. But I think like for any individual education channel, especially if you have a lower amount of entertainment mixed in, like I'm just going to take it to the extreme. Let's say you're just 100 percent education. There's mm-hmm. no fluff. There's no funny commentary. It's just uh, just learning how to do the thing. I think you're going to have a smaller audience for that specific thing. And when you're doing education, I feel like, especially if it's, you know, there's not entertainment mixed in, um, you have to kind of be more of an expert in the thing you're doing. And you're not likely to be an expert, an equal expert in like, uh, how to, uh, I don't know, keep plants alive (laughs) or how to powder coat your Yeti and how to build a computer, you know? So like you're, you're probably going to be a little bit more niche by nature unless you are mixing in entertainment. And then like how well you know your topic is. Doesn't matter as much, (laughs) which is is one thing we've leaned on. Yeah, We (laughs) can be less experts because we're not telling people what to do. (laughs) Yeah. We're we're showing people how we did something in in a hopefully entertaining way. Yeah. 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 But I think that one advantage that education really does have is it provides an immediate kind of tangible value Mm-hmm. to the viewer which i think is easier when you're starting out because if you just start out from day one and you're like hey i'm vlogging and i'm funny and i'm f- a funny person <laughs> I, I feel like people will look at you with your zero subscribers and your one video and be like who's this person i don't i don't care what you're having for lunch yeah but if you you're know? like and, and of course and of course people can like you know there are breakout successes mm. but i feel like for a lot of channels that are that are more entertainment based, it helps to kind of like build upon that. And it might Mm -hmm. be a little harder to start from the very beginning. Yeah. And same, same with kind of niche and broad content. I think that if you choose a niche, especially if it's one that's seeing a lot of growth right now, you can experience a lot of growth right away Yeah, because you can be a bigger fish in a smaller pond. Yeah. So like Simone Yurt says, the biggest way to stand out in your field is to create a whole new field. Yes. And then you are immediately the expert in that field. Yes. You know, So it's like the, the more yeah. niche you are, the more you can stand out. Um, but hopefully you choose a niche and you go about it in a way that doesn't limit you in the long term. Because the broader category you kind of fall under, the more you can kind of grow and change and evolve over time. Whereas if you really niche down, mm-hmm. it might be harder to grow outside of that niche. And I think some of it just depends on like knowing yourself. You yeah. know? So when we started our channel... We knew we wanted to make stuff, so that that was kind of committing to a category somewhat, Um, but it was a very broad category. But we knew we would want to bounce around and try a bunch of new things all the time. So from day one, we really varied the types of maker videos that we did. Um, But you might be someone who is like, I, I have been collecting rocks my entire <laughs> life and I want I, like I would feel no greater pleasure than to share my love of rocks with the world for the rest of my life <laughs> and you know your thing and it's rocks it sounds like you're a completely different type of person who just loves rocks I'm convinced now tell me more about rocks see my passion it just <laughs> it it through. came through with the rocks <laughs> yes um well and that kind of goes to to something else is like make videos about things you're passionate about. Yeah, that's a which huge sounds, bit of advice. It sounds I mean, yeah. really cliche, but it's kind of like what you were saying earlier with the Minecraft videos. If you only do something to chase a trend, trends change. Yep. And it's not guaranteed that that's always going to be successful. And just, again, like we were saying with change, change is kind of hard to make. And so if you end up getting yourself stuck doing a certain type of videos simply because you thought they would be successful, but then the trend changed and you're like, well, I don't want to do this anymore. That's going to suck. <laughs> yeah. And the, the reason why it changes hard is because consistency is really important. The yeah. viewer that has subscribed to you kind of needs to know what to expect. And hopefully they, they know what to look forward to. 
Mm-hmm. And like if, if when you push that publish button and it goes out to your subscribers, you want every single one of them or as many as possible to be really excited to watch it. Because if you build up a subscriber base around an expectation of one thing and then you change and then you're, you're providing them a different thing, mm-hmm. they won't click it as much. And then YouTube will take that as a sign that your content isn't good mm-hmm. because YouTube can't know everything. All they can see are numbers and data. And when your viewers and your subscribers are sending YouTube data that your video isn't good, that yep. that's that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and I think when it comes to consistency, and I think when it comes to consistency, don't don't make that. Uh, uh, that doesn't mean that you have to follow the exact same recipe yeah. for every single video. And there are mm-hmm. channels that that do that and do that successfully. Um, but it just means that there needs to be some element that is consistent. Yeah. So, um, for us, you know, our projects vary, but they're almost always projects and, um, there's always the two of us and there's always the two of us and we're always being pr- like pretty goofy. Um, that part has changed because we started out more in the, on the educational side with a dose of goofiness and now we're like goofy with a dose of <laughs> <laughs> education. Um, that's true. But uh, I think as long as there's some elements that are consistent. And, and, and you can find your own consistent elements. Like maybe it's your editing style. Maybe mm-hmm. it's your filming style. Your mm-hmm. cinematics are always like off the charts crazy. Or you always have this dry sense of humor in the voiceover or whatever it is. There can be a lot of different things that are consistent that, that tie all of your videos together. So like, yeah. I, I, like Caitlin said, like find what you're most passionate about passionate about but also lean into the things that make you kind of weird or unique or quirky or whatever it is like think about like what you were known for at this job or in high school or within a certain group of friends and kind of like lean into that part of your identity Mm -hmm. to kind of like tie everything together or if you don't want to put a personality in then that can be your thing too be part of your thing yeah yeah who knows so another thing is just do a lot of research we Still watch a lot of YouTube and it's all very important research. Very um, important. <laughs> but but seriously, like watch a lot of stuff. Pay attention to why you're watching it. Pay attention to is it the person's personality? Is it like great cinematography? Is it really good storytelling? And pick what elements you like and you can mix and match those into your own type of content. Or you can just use that research to to like learn best practices in the type of content you want to do. Like, let's say you want to do cooking videos. Mm -hmm. You might watch some binging with Babish. You might watch Bon Appetit. You know, you can start seeing the things that are consistent between the channels you like that seem to do well. Yeah. And you can don't just watch like really good channels. You can also watch kind of like smaller channels and see like what you would change. And that's like a really good practice to get into. Yeah. And I think that another thing that really helps with figuring out how to develop your own unique style, let's say that you really like binging with Babish and his general aesthetic or something, and you pull a lot from there, but then you also watch like this vlog channel that has this thing that you think is hilarious to pull in, or you watch this gaming channel and they do a lot of, you know, special effects or noises or sound effects. You can kind of like pull like a lot of different inspiration from different types of channels. So sometimes watching videos that are outside of the Mm -hmm. niche Mm -hmm. that you are trying to get into will really help like diversify your content and make you stand out and and, and find what resonates with you. Don't just say like, Oh, this one gets a lot of views. This one gets a lot of views. I'm just going to do that. No, no. Like, Find it needs to be genuine. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, cause if you are setting this up as a career, you might be doing this for the rest of your career. And if you don't like it, It's it's not sustainable. I know we're going to be saying this a lot, but I think we just need to hit on this point. It's like repetition is the key to learning. Right now, for those of you listening, we're just pretending to hit things with a hammer. Yes, repeatedly. (laughs) It's just like in our videos. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah. Like like, so. So for one example, I think that a lot of people are inspired by Casey Neistat. Yeah, I mean, his cinematography is awesome. His storytelling is awesome. And you might think like, wow, that looks so fun. I want to do that. But then you you start filming and you realize, wow, making content almost every day is really hard. It's really hard to make my life interesting. <laughs> as fun as it looks when he's doing it, it's kind of stressful to me because I'm just, a, yeah. I'm just eating cereal today and it's not that exciting. You know? yeah, I'm not in New York. 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 I'm not in New
So yeah. it's like not everyone can make that type of content, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and, and you might get bored of it. Like let's say that you mm-hmm. like start committing to daily content and people expect that and then you get bored or tired, you know? So it's like, like set yourself up for the sustainable long term right from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. And I think with, yeah. I was going to say, and, and like, know that things probably will change and we'll probably talk about change a, a little bit later yeah. as well. Um, but definitely do your research so that you go into it the best you can. Yeah. All right. With all of that covered, okay. now we're going to talk about how to start making your content. Not how to grow yet, but like tips for how to start. Because I think that this is a huge barrier for a lot of people. They, they know they want to make YouTube content. Yeah, they've done the brainstorming. <laughs> they watched a whole lot of YouTube. And they're still watching a whole lot of YouTube, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> Watch our channel, too, maybe a little bit. <laughs> Sorry. But, I mean, you know, like how to start is really intimidating because it's not that natural of a thing for a lot of people. Yeah. So I think, you know, putting yourself out there. First, I'm just talking to a camera is weird. <laughs> putting yourself out there on the Internet feels really weird. And so if this is intimidating to you and that's what's holding you back, but you still want to do YouTube, I think one thing that you can do is start practicing on a less intimidating platform. So let's say you're making stuff and you want to start a maker channel, but that's very scary. You can start posting your projects on Instagram. And I I think that's awesome because, or for a few reasons. One, taking an Instagram photo is generally going to take a lot less work than recording and editing an entire video. So, a lot less. <laughs> so there's less, there's less time commitment. To you can even, even if you, you are doing little videos, it's like a one minute max. So you're kind of capped in terms of how much you're expected to put out there. Three, you can start finding your voice and kind of like practicing in this, you know, this little like training wheels kind of stage. Um, and finding your voice, not only just like literally speaking, but like writing and your style. Yeah, and your like, style. Like how you engage with the community and all of that. Mm-hmm. There's a lot that goes into it. Well, and that's the next thing too, is you can start building your own community so that when you do launch your YouTube channel, you have a community, a community, like a group of people to launch it to. So you're not just starting from scratch. You already kind of have people that you've been interacting with. And like making a YouTube video takes so much longer than whatever you were, we're going to make the YouTube video about. So if, if we're making a thing, making a thing and a video at the same time, it takes twice as long. If you're going to the store and you're going to be filming a vlog about your day, you're going to get half as much done because filming takes so much time. Yeah. Well, and then there's editing too. (laughs) And then there's editing. So it's like, like, also it's like with Instagram, you can kind of soft launch different ideas Mm -hmm. and see what ideas really stand out in the community. And you can go through a whole bunch more things in that form faster and Mm -hmm. find your footing in that way. Yeah. 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 I think also like uh, the fear of being on camera can be very intimidating. And so a few tips to make that less scary is, um, you can just record a video with no intent of putting it online. You can just record it. You can edit it. And it's that's, kind of that's, like, that's what we did with two of our vlogs. We did. And then we ended up <laughs> posting them. <laughs> but but it takes a lot of the pressure off. You're going to be more natural on camera because you're not worrying about, oh, my God, everyone's going to see this. And, like, can they tell that I'm sweating, you know? <laughs> um, so it, it just takes a lot of the pressure off and gives you practice. And, yes, it might seem like you're putting all this work into something that nobody sees. But, hey, if it turns out awesome, you can use it as one of your videos. But there's no pressure on it. Yeah. I mean, awesome. we were so awkward at the beginning. Like, looking back at our that first, first video, video. Oh, my oh. gosh. We were just, like putting handles on, on an a, Ikea, dresser. Ikea dresser and it took us so long, so, so many long. takes. I, I swear the intro to that video took us three hours yeah. of filming. Yeah. Yeah. We did it so many times and we just left the camera running the whole time. time. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of footage. It was, it was so footage. much footage. And also like, I think that one thing that's important to keep in mind is you you can decide not to be on camera too much. Yeah. Like being on camera isn't like a necessity to make a YouTube video. Yeah, I mean think of like Clickspring. Yeah. For example, he does really satisfying machining videos, tons of followers. He's not really no. in his videos. It's just yeah. his stuff, you know? Yeah. And uh I think that another thing that like because YouTube like the, the a lot of YouTube is like 
bubbly and a lot of personality and like generally pretty positive. I mean, we're pretty positive people, but that doesn't mean that needs to be who you are. There, there's this one channel that I kind of love. It's like a cartoon animated channel and the narrator is just kind of grumpy the whole time. He's grumpy. He has like kind of a harsh sense of humor and it's hilarious. Yeah. So like it, you don't need to be a certain type of something in order to find success. One thing that we've learned over time that's really important to creating a YouTube video is figuring out like the format of the video, like what your story is before you start recording. Then you know kind of what mm -hmm. to record, what to time lapse through, what to talk about, and kind of like how to shape it all from the beginning. And if you kind of know the story and the arc, it's so much less stressful than just like starting and filming everything. Yeah, and I, I think it's something that in the beginning, it's probably easier if you actually formally write down this stuff. And towards the end, you can, or once you have more practice, it can be a little looser. You can keep track of it more in your head. But yeah. for, for example, our channel, um, there's kind of a built-in story arc with every video because we are making something in almost every video. So there's, yeah, you start with raw materials and, and you end, end up, up with, with a thing. thing. <laughs> yeah. And there's like trials and tribulations along the way. Um, so, so that part was decided, but... In the beginning, we would actually write down a shot list, everything we needed. A shot list and like general words we wanted to say. Yeah, Sometimes even we, just like 100% scripting it out. Because it was mostly voiceover. Yeah. So, I mean, we might happen to capture some in the moment stuff, but we, we planned the voiceover and we planned the shots. That's so crazy to think back and remember because I remember like not liking like voiceover <laughs> session where I, where I it. sat down and I recorded lines. I did not like that. It would at take all. you a really long time. Because I am bad at like. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Because I would, I would edit it and yeah. I would do my own voiceover yeah. for the whole thing just so I could keep going on the edit and I didn't have to keep grabbing you. <laughs> and then I would choose like, okay, which voiceover spots should Evan take? Yeah. But I talk a lot faster than you. <laughs> and so, and I, we would have the video perfectly timed to the music. So I couldn't yeah. like extend the scene. So I'd be like, okay, Evan say, Next, we're going to glue down the thing, and then we're going to wrap the edges, and then we're going to do this thing to this thing. And you're like, next, we're going to glue down the thing. I'm like, no, next, we're going to glue down the thing. <laughs> faster. <laughs> faster, faster. And so it was like such a struggle oh, to say your words struggle. at the pace that I was saying my words. But see, that's something that we started with. That was our crutch for a while, and then we evolved past that. So We did. Yeah. We, we did. We, we <laughs> evolved. But I think but it, it can be helpful to kind of storyboard out your video, yeah. especially like in the beginning. Having a beginning, middle, and end. Like having a conclusion really helps a video stand out in, in, in someone's mind. You mm -hmm. know, it's like, oh, I watched that, and they did this to this. Like even if there's like mini plot points within your videos, you know, mm -hmm. like try to set things up. And I think one, one way to set things up is you predict something, you do the thing, and then you react afterwards. And that's like kind of a, a pretty easy template you can apply to almost any type of video. Yeah. So it's like if we are about to do a resin pour, we will chit chat, say how we think it's going to go, then we do it. And as we're doing it, we're reacting to how it's actually going. So like predictions and reactions are a huge way to add or, story as opposed yeah. to just like doing the thing and not saying anything about it. Or even it. if like you're a travel vlogger, let's say that you're going to this place and you've, you've, you're telling the camera like, man, I've heard about this place. I hear it's the best pizza in the entire world. And you get there and you try it and then you react. Is it actually the best pizza in the world or is it actually really bad? Yeah, and, and then, there's so much story there, so much more story there than if you just went and you're like, and I had pizza at this place. It wasn't great. But if you were like, I'm going to like the highest rated pizza place in this city. And then yeah. you go and you're like, you know, it really didn't live up to my expectations. Or, There's so much more story there. This is the best pizza I've ever had in my entire world. I am part in of the club. my entire world. <laughs> <laughs> I am good at words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it just, it adds a, a lot more. And again, this the, that may not be applicable if you're doing like strictly educational based stuff. But I think you can even take some hints of that and apply it to education. Like yeah. if you're... If you're doing a, a cooking channel or a cooking video and you're like, okay, this is where you flip the pancake. And so if it's, if it's not cooked enough, it's going to fall apart. If it's cooked too much, it's going to be burnt on the bottom. So let's flip it and see. You flip it. See, oh, see, it cracked a little bit. It's, yeah. That means it's, you know. Yeah, and you can teach. Or like let's say you're teaching welding. There's a lot of things you can teach from like 
like saying how it's going to go and then show pointing out the flaws and what you just did or whatever. You yeah. Know? yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. you know, not, it's same, same, but different. Same, same, but different. Yeah, yeah. That's true. But also it's like one way to like, like this is like kind of like a little hack on how to make your videos more entertaining. If you're going after that, you can just put yourself in interesting or funny situations, which is one thing we picked up from William Osmond when we did collaborations yeah, with him. It's our like very first collaboration. Our very first collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We were definitely putting ourselves in funny situations, but yeah, that's a great way to kind of, just think like, okay, what would be funny? I'll just do that thing. Yeah, even if it's like slightly uncomfortable, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've like taken, uh, you know, we made DIY uh, uh, super soakers and yeah. we took them to, to the park. Because that's going to be a lot that's more. that's going to be funnier. Yeah, it's like more can happen there than ever just in our backyard. Yeah. You know, and there's a wedding in the background, which was like, Kind of hilarious. Yeah, there was a wedding. <laughs> I wonder if we're in some pictures. That'd be awesome. That That'd would, make my day. That that would be pretty funny. Hey, they're the ones that had their wedding at a public park with yep. lots of other people around. It they were asking just, for a water gun fight in the background. It wasn't just us like disrupting a wedding. There's also like kids playing Pokemon Go and all yep. sorts of stuff. <laughs> well, I think that that can like transition us into pacing tips. Pacing. I think this is probably one of the hardest things to figure out. It's really hard to communicate. It's really like, hard to communicate. You watch a video and you're like, it's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like so, sometimes you can say, um, oh, it's it's a little slow. Or sometimes you can say, oh, they rushed through that too fast. But it's it's hard to touch on like why something is just right. Yeah. And I think that the reason why pacing is so, so important to get right is because YouTube videos are people's active time. They're usually like, you know, on their phone, just looking at the phone, looking at the video, or they're on their couch, or they're like researching, mm -hmm. um, like, uh, like they, they, they just punched a hole in the wall or something and they're looking at how to fix it and they just want to fix it. Um, for so, people who don't, Evan's referencing to our how to patch drywall video, which yeah. was one of our very first <laughs> ones. And a lot of people comment, I just punched a hole in my wall. Thanks. <laughs> a lot of people. We get those comments people. like quite a lot. A lot of very angry people. <laughs> um, so it's like, th this is, this is people's active time. So you, as you, opposed to like a podcast where it's yes. kind of passive listening, where people can be driving to work or making dinner or doing yard work and they're listening. It's, yeah. it's like we have room to mess Banter up and, and be a little slower yeah. with our delivery. Okay, then people just turned you up to 2x speed. <laughs> <laughs> a little slower with our delivery. <laughs> um, but I think that like general tips that we can give to kind of get you started along that direction, you can cut out dead spaces. Like don't leave in these long moments and lingering pauses. Now you don't want to go too far with all the jump cuts because I think that's some people... Like some people do that, like Philip DeFranco, you know, I think does a lot of jump cuts. I think I think I'm gonna backtrack a bit. Okay, yeah. I'm not gonna say cut out all your dead space. I'm not gonna say jump cuts are bad. I'm gonna say make sure you have a balance of like have the video be slower when it needs to be slower and mm. faster when it needs to be faster. So if yeah, if like you're if having yeah. a, if you're having a heart to heart with the camera and you're saying you know, I'm about to try this really hard step or I'm about to do this challenging <laughs> thing. Here is, here is why I'm scared to do this and I'm a little nervous and this could happen and this could happen. You want to leave in your, your dramatic yeah, pauses. Yeah. I'm just imagining good jump cuts through all of that. It'd be horrible. <laughs> yeah, it would be, it would be terrible. It would totally lose the effect. Um, you know, and then you do the thing and maybe um, there's not too many dramatic cuts. You, you do the thing and you just see how it goes. And it's terrible. And then, so you have to do it five more times to get it right. Those five more times, you speed through those. Yeah. You know, just yeah. to, I know this is kind of vague because I'm just talking about some miscellaneous thing that you were doing on this video, but there's definitely times where you want it to be slower and times mm -hmm. where it makes sense to just like get to, get the, things going. Get to the goods. Yeah, yeah. And I think that also like even with comedy, pauses with comedy can be... Some of the best moments. <laughs> I was pausing for oh, effect. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Caitlin just was like, ruined my comedic moment. I'm sorry. My genius. Do you want another? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's gone. The moment has <laughs> <is> passed. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think that... Uh, I, I think well, another way to kind of like keep the pace up, because part of it is about timing, like slower versus faster, but part of it is mixing up the type of footage. So if you have a mix of um, 
you know, talking points where you're like a talking head talking to the camera mixed with B-roll, mixed with time lapse. I, that's going to help keep the pacing up as opposed to if the entire video is just talking heads, which, I mean, we're doing that, but this is a podcast. So, yeah, so it's you know, different. If you're watching, you could also be listening right now. <laughs> yeah. Duh. Anyways. Um, but I think that one, one thing where it's really, really important, and this is kind of going into kind of SEO type, analytical type things, but the intro and the outro are by mm. far the most important parts of a YouTube video because the intro, that's where you try to catch people, pull them in. That's and the, the outro, most. you don't want to lose them too frequently because if someone makes it all the way through your video and to another video, they didn't exit on your video. They're exiting on mm -hmm. someone else's video. So like Yeah, so we've even noticed some channels have super abrupt endings. It's just like they're talking, talking, and then ha ha and the like, video oh. ended and you, you made it hundred percent of the way through, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so it's like you don't want to go too far down the hacky way, but like in no, general, but like, for keep, example keep down the asks. Don't ask too many things at the end. And or the intro, or the intro. Definitely don't ask too many things oh, in the intro. No, no, no. I, whenever I, I, because we follow some like you know uh, YouTube related subreddits, and one of the most common pet peeves when people are asking for advice is when people have all their asks up front in the intro. Yeah. When people are like asking you to subscribe and like and ring the bell before they've even started the video. Yeah. 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 So no, it's, no. It's interesting. No, no. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> and when it comes to actually filming all this stuff, one tip that we have found really helpful is to edit either in your head or for real as you go. And this is, some people do this and some people don't. We've tried it both ways where we film the entire video and then we edit it. Or we've done where we film a couple hours and then we edit and then we film a couple hours and we edit. And we like the latter because I feel like it helps us with pacing. It's a little bit easier to actually edit it as you go. And then you know, like, well, I just spent a whole lot of time talking so this next part, I should kind of speed through it a little bit. Yeah, or like, like let's say you try to say something four times and you know in your head the very first part of the first take was good and the last part of the last take was good. Yeah, so, then you don't have to keep, keep that information in your head. You can yeah. just like go slap those two parts together and then keep going. Yeah, because you don't want like too much in your head while you're trying to make and film and everything. And honestly, in the beginning, you're probably going to film – way too much. I know we did. Yeah. And I think that in a way, it's almost a little bit easier to film too much. I'd kind of err on the side of filming a little bit too much rather than too little. Because you're not going to go back. Yeah, in the beginning, it, it will take longer and you will film more than you need. Mm -hmm. And like going back to the pacing, you have to be a little bit brutal on the editing floor. You, like even if like you thought you did like a really clever shot and took a long time, mm -hmm. but it just doesn't work in the edit, you got to be brutal with yourself. You got to be brutal. You got to cut that out, you know? Yeah. And I think one thing you can do, well, maybe this is getting a little ahead of myself. Sometimes it's hard to um, know yourself, especially when you've been like editing for forever. Yeah. And you've been, I know you've Caitlin gets in these like fugues. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I go into editing fugue state. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It, it, you've rewatched the same scene 20 times and the things that made you chuckle the first time, like you don't crack a smile at the 20th time and you're like, I have no idea if this is good anymore. So it really helps to have somebody else that you can show the video to that hasn't been as deep in the edit as you have. That's me. That's Evan. Because Caitlin does all of our editing. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. But it could be like a family member or a friend or, oh my gosh, if you have like a kid you can show it to, they're going to be the most brutally yeah, honest. Yeah. You soon, just see when they yeah. look away and yeah. you're like, well. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's when we lost them. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. All right. Well, I think that takes us all the way to gear and technical. I think that we get a lot of questions about this too, and I think it's less important than people think. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we just don't want to like say, ah, it's not important, and like skip over it. We'll give some like actual we'll advice on tips. this. Yeah, yeah, some tips. I think the biggest tip mm -hmm. is that like the thing that matters most is audio. By far. By mm -hmm. far. Yeah. You can get away with pretty crappy video as long as your audio is okay. And, and mm -hmm. I think the reason why is because like watching subpar video doesn't necessarily like hurt your eyes. It just might be slightly annoying, but listening to bad audio actually like annoys you. Yeah. And also like, like if it's too loud or not clear enough or it's too soft or there's too much background noise, it's just like, I just, I just, just can't annoying. do it. And most yeah. people can't do it. Yeah. It's They'll annoying. just leave. <laughs> yeah. They're not going to forgive you. It doesn't matter what you're doing. If the audio is terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think that like, you know, along those lines, 
even if you're just starting with your phone, you can get like a, a shotgun mic, mm -hmm. you can get a lav mic, um, but like start there if you're gonna like really get going on a YouTube mm -hmm. channel, start and, with audio. And I think like, you know, it's, it's hard to, if we just list a bunch of products we use, it's kind of hard to retain audibly. Yeah, so I we'll, think we'll, we'll list it all in the description below. Yeah, we'll put it all in the video description with links to mm -hmm. all the stuff that we use. Um, but also like think about, again, it all goes back to what type of content you're making. Like, yeah, is if, it, do you need 4k? Do you need autofocus? Do you need stabilization? Do you need that flip lens for that selfie mode? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that like will be decided by what type of content you're making. That is very true. Yes. Yeah. So like if you're doing, um, if you're vlogging, well, I'll just look at yeah, that. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> um, Caitlin, you can talk about editing a little bit. There's not that much to share, though. No. I mean, people ask us what we use. We use Premiere. Um, <laughs> Good story. <laughs> <laughs> we use Premiere. Uh, there's tutorials online. I would suggest just kind of learning a few very, very basic basics. Like, when I say basic, I mean, like, how to cut clips and how to drag them. That's, that's pretty much all you need to get started with editing. How to just cut the clip and how to drag it on the timeline. Yeah, and you can do that Every, in almost any program. There's yeah. a lot of free ones out there too. And everything else, don't worry about like learning everything perfectly. Just no. if you come across something that you need to figure out, just YouTube search it and there will be a tutorial on yeah. it. And you can figure it out as you go. Yeah, and in terms of music, there are some really good resources we can yes. share. Yeah, so... Um, uh, YouTube audio library is probably going to be the first place we're going to recommend people to go. Mm -hmm. It's huge. There are so many songs that so many people use. And sound effects too. And sound effects. And they're all like, they won't get flagged by YouTube system because they're in YouTube system. So that's, the you know? so that's the safest place to go. There's also places where you can license music. Um, and those are great. Sometimes they will still get flagged because mm -hmm. you or the person flagging it doesn't know that you have you know, bought the license to it. Um, so things, you know, I mean, we've used audio blocks. Um, there's also, um, one awesome, awesome, awesome resource. Awesome. Like, so many YouTubers use his sound and his yeah. music. It's amazing. It's, it's so a website, again, we'll link to all of these in is the website in competech.com. The man's name is Kevin McLeod and he thank has, you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. He oh. has so much music. It's amazing. Most of our songs are his <laughs> yeah, these Kevin, days. I just, I just want to like, I want to look up an interview now and just like see what his He's life just a, is. A gift of a person to put <laughs> so much music out there for people to use. Yeah. Um, another awesome place is Patreon. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we we found a couple artists that we really really liked on SoundCloud, and a lot of times people will give out their music for free on SoundCloud if you like properly credit them. But a lot of times those artists also have Patreon, and you can get songs that aren't listed on SoundCloud yeah. or like more convenient downloads of their stuff where you can download a whole album instead of tracks individually mm -hmm. and things like that. And I think that's a great resource because then you're also like supporting someone. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 So, <laughs> so I think we should talk about branding now. And again, it seems like Caitlin's going to be like telling you most of the things because yeah. she is the expert at all of the things we've talked about so far. I'm like, <laughs> what am I doing on this channel? <laughs> like, Caitlin, share your experience on all these things. <laughs> I'll, you I'll know cue a lot you. Of stuff. I'll cue you up. <laughs> you know a lot of stuff. Okay, so now we're kind of moving away from the how to figure out what kind of content to make and how to make it to how to launch that content. Yes. Which is huge huge and i think i think a lot of people i don't know i, I it's one of those things where you in, until you do it you don't there's no practice run you know no yeah you can't practice launching and i think that some people might have like this vision in their head where you just like make good content and you upload it to youtube and stuff happens and magic things grow and everyone finds you somehow but like yes, that's not you really have to put a lot of thought into the launch and, and the more work and thought and effort you put into the launch, the better things will go. Yes. So as is a common theme with all of this. <laughs> just put in more time and it's better. <laughs> so as you were saying, branding, I think, is a really great place to start. Um, so in, in terms of branding, I mean, you don't, you don't have to have every single little aspect of your brand figured out. But I think you need a name for your channel. You need a logo. And I would say that you need channel art yeah. for that your channel banner. And I think that some of that goes back to letting your know, letting your audience know what to expect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like think if, about if, that. If you have a schedule, if you have a type of content you're making, the name, the logo, all of that 
like when someone goes to your page, let's say that like I send you this link and I'm like, check out this channel and you go there, the branding should tell you what type of channel it is along mm -hmm. with like the videos and the thumbnails and all yeah. of that stuff. But yeah. So before you launch your channel out there in, into the world, you want to have that stuff set up because people are way more likely to understand what your channel is about and click subscribe. If they, if you have a, you know, nice looking channel banner and a consistent logo mm -hmm. and, um, I just, I mean, I just think that stuff's very important and it's going to stick with you. Yeah. And, and if, if you start with one sort of branding and you try to change later, it can be really painful. We, we, we know, we've known multiple people who have gone through difficult times or at least trials and tribulations because they tried to change their name and things went wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Along with that, like I would say, once you have your name chosen, reserve all your social media handles on every single platform every, there is. Even if you're like, I hate Twitter, I'm never going to tweet. Just get it anyway. You might. You, <laughs> might. you might tweet. <laughs> and then like, like, let's say that you're like, um, uh, Yamaha 49 at, <laughs> are you just reading? The <laughs> yes, name I, on our... yes, yes, I am. <laughs> let's say that you're, you're Yamaha man. On, uh, <laughs> on love Yamaha <laughs> and uh, on your YouTube, but then like Yamaha man gets taken up on Twitter. That's unfortunate, you that's know. Unfortunate. And then like then then when you're trying to give people your handles, you're like then you follow have to me be... at Yamaha man like forever on Twitter. Yamaha man Yama five Yamaha on guy Instagram. on Snapchat. Yeah, yeah. yeah you want to like get it as consistent as you can across yeah. all your social. It's media nice channels. that we can say like follow us up at Evan and Caitlin on Everywhere. every single platform if you want to exactly <laughs> yeah so um so yeah so that would definitely be an important part before launch i think also and this goes back to what we were saying when it um we were talking about going for a test run on instagram if you've started test running putting out your content out there in little small doses on instagram um engaging with that community and building up that community will help you have someone to launch to and i think even just that, even if it's not huge, I think we had 500 subscribers or followers on Instagram yeah. when we launched our channel. It's still somebody. It's still 500 people that you didn't have otherwise to launch. It's to. somebody. You know, it's like find that community. If you're Yamaha man, find your fellow audio enthusiasts, engage <laughs> with them. And when you launch your Yamaha man channel, people will want to check out and see what you've been working on that you've mm -hmm. been like teasing on your Instagram and stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think also um, tell people when you're going to launch, yeah. which we, we did do that. I'm very glad we did, even though it was kind of stressful, it was because, super stressful. because we had like an external <laughs> deadline. Um, but we told our friends and family, we announced it on our Instagram that we have a big announcement coming on this day. Uh, we told our friends at work, <laughs> we yeah. like told everybody. And so then we had to do it because we talked to so many people who, you know, we'll see them at events year after year and they're like, well, I'm still, I'm still going to start the channel. I just haven't yet. And it's like, if you, if you set a date, then you have to do it and then you'll do it. And it's, it's starting a channel is kind of like planting a tree yeah. where it's like the best time was years ago. <laughs> the second best time is now. It's uh, so true. But you don't want to keep putting it off and putting it off because it's going to get harder and harder as you do. One, one specific thing that we recommend to, to people we've talked to who are thinking about launching a channel, start with a batch of videos because mm -hmm. you only kind of get, it's like meeting someone for the first time. You only get one, one chance impression. to make a first impression, you know? Mm -hmm. And let's say that you're Yamaha man and you want to do like <laughs> reviews of audio equipment and like events that you go to around audio equipment and like other things you want to show people your full breadth of what you're going to be doing. And it gives people multiple chances to like say, Oh, that looks interesting because if you only have one video and someone goes to your channel, they're going to be making the decision whether to subscribe or not based on a single video as opposed mm -hmm. to multiple chances. And that single video will set their expectations. Yes. So if, if you want people to think you're only doing reviews of audio equipment, because that's what you want to do, then you might want to have four different audio equipment reviews. But if you want people to think maybe you're just a channel that does tech reviews in general, maybe you have one that's audio mm -hmm. thing, mm -hmm. one that's a camera review, one that's a TV review, one that's mm -hmm. a whatever review. And that's such a stronger message than just a single video. Yeah. Like actions speak louder than words or advertising, you know? Yeah. And videos speak louder than... I don't know. The, the analogy is breaking down, but you get the point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So for, for our channel, we started with 
I think one or two home improvement videos, a concrete video, a woodworking video, probably one other thing. I don't remember exactly, but it was a mix of different maker videos because we wanted to send that message from the beginning that we would have a mix of things and give people more chances to subscribe. Yeah. And I think another thing or t two more reasons why it's good to have like a batch of videos. One is. Oh, yeah. This is so important, actually. I, I think I know where one? you're going. Which one am I going to say? I'm um, going to say both refining your oh that's one okay i'll start oh, yeah, with that one right. so it, it might take you a couple tries to feel good about your editing and video style yes <laughs> <laughs> so our our first video like we talked about earlier where we added knobs to an ikea dresser i pretty much re-edited the entire thing after we recorded our second video because after the second one, I was like, oh, I feel like I'm getting the hang of this. The first one's terrible. And we, we even went back and refilmed like intro or scenes or transitions. Yeah. We redid voiceovers and we had that opportunity to like, like get, get to version two. Yeah, because you know? we didn't just publish that one video and then move on. And once it's up on YouTube, it's, it's up. It's there. I mean, you could delete it, but again, like you don't want to announce your channel and have that one first impression and then like delete it and announce it again. Yeah. So, so I think it does help you to figure out your style. If you're, if you're doing a few videos, it like gives you builds, you builds in like a grace period yes. to edit them. But I think another thing is, so when we wa launched our channel, we didn't want people to just find our one video, see that that's the only video we had and think like, Oh, I just thought you were making a really weird face. <laughs> <laughs> You're trying to distract me. And, and, and we don't want people to see our one video and think that we were just a one-off. And yeah. that, that we just uploaded this one video and whatever. We, we felt like if we had multiple videos, people would see them and think, oh, okay, these people are uploading continually and consistently. And this is a thing they are doing. It's not just some couple randomly uploaded a video. Yeah. You know? Exactly. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. Guys, now... Guess what time it is? I don't know. I don't know. Do you want to answer? Yeah, it's it's it's, it's how to grow. Oh, what <laughs> everyone came here for? How to grow? <laughs> We've just been like talking for all this time about all this background stuff, but like the background this is, stuff's important. It's the most important, but this is what you've come for: how to grow. How to grow? How to grow your YouTube channel? This is the most difficult part of everyone's careers, like growing from zero. So many people have said that this is the most painful part of the process. Like when you're at zero, the first 100 is the hardest. The first 1,000 is the hardest. Then the next 10,000 is the hardest. But like once you get going, it kind of... The momentum builds upon itself. I'm not going to say it really gets easier, but it no. gets more rewarding. <laughs> the, the growth aspect of it like builds upon itself yeah you don't have to work as hard for every single view yeah it's kind of like when you find a product on amazon you know and it has zero reviews you're like is should i get this but like the more like watches you get the more subs you get it's kind of like the community buying in and endorsing you in a way yeah like if you see a video pop up on your home page and it's like um this changes everything and it has zero views or this changes everything it. and it has 5 million views. You're yes. like, what does this change? Exactly. Exactly. What changed? And I think the biggest thing is people aren't just going to find you. Yeah. Especially and when you're at zero, you know, especially when you're at zero, there's so many new channels, so many new videos uploaded every single day. And when you start, you're just one of those. And so, um, you really have to work to bring people to your channel. Um, when we first started, 80% of our views were from outside of YouTube. So that means places where our video was embedded outside of YouTube. And all of that was done by us. We were sharing it on Instructables. We were sharing it on Reddit. We were putting it on our blog. And this kind of goes back to like what type of content you make. Mm -hmm. Finding those communities, knowing where that content is shared, how it's shared, the kind of like etiquette around all of that. Like, Promote it, but promote it like where it makes the most sense for your videos and your community. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So as as a maker uh -huh. channel, Instructables made a lot of sense for us. Yes. Um, but it might be different for you if you're a travel channel or a cooking channel. Or, or an auto body shop channel. Yeah. Who knows? You know, but like like one one thing that I think a lot of people might overlook is just – Share it with your social circles. Share it with your friends, your family, your coworkers. Ask them to share it around. Like that 
that might be enough to like start things moving. Yeah, it's like it, it's kind of like what is the joke where it's like I I two guys are running away from a bear yes. and he's like I don't need to run faster than the bear I just need to run faster than you. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like that in the beginning. It's like you don't have to instantly go viral. You just have to have more views than other people who are starting at zero. You yeah. know, to start like building up your momentum. So yeah. so whereas right now us telling uh, like our friends to share it on social media, to share a video on social media might not make a huge difference, but in the beginning it does make a huge difference compared to your size. Yeah. And again, like I hate to say this, but like, I'm not sure if we have said it yet. You have to have good content. I mean, well, yeah, <laughs> that's a whole, like, n- that's a whole another thing. I mean, we, we, we had a section in this whole talk about like how to make your content good. It has to stand out in some way. It has to like, do whatever, but like all of this is kind of with the caveat that it kind of has to be good. I think if you implement some of the tips we talked about earlier with like pacing and yeah. filming tips and having a story. Or adding value or serving a niche that's underserved or what have you. Yeah. But at the same time, like it also has to be good. It I don't has know. to be good. <laughs> like, let's just let's just have that as like an underlying understanding. An, an understanding. Yeah. The the reason everyone just says like, well it just has to be good content and no one really goes into it is because it's very subjective and it's very hard and to it's, it, put there, your finger on every single part of it that makes it there good. also aren't any like all of the things we've talked about so far they're all like general best practices that you mm-hmm. can be applied to all sorts of different content types and all sorts of different videos but like what makes content good depends so much on everything it's not even something i can say like all entertainment videos should yeah blank yeah. you know okay so sorry i kind of went on a little tangent there <laughs> I just thought I'd throw it out there. Yes. Okay. But so back to sharing your stuff. So like I said, 80% of our views came from outs from us pushing it outside of YouTube. But our theory is that the other 20% we got from YouTube was only because we had a little traction with that the the views we were getting outside of it. You and know? I feel like that's kind of true. Like yeah. cause especially because we were doing like at that point kind of slightly more niche slightly more educational content than we're doing now. And we were trying to rely on search too. Now, when you search and you see a video with zero views, you probably never see a video with zero views because YouTube just won't even serve it up. But yeah. like, you have to have some views to start showing up in search and start trending for different types of topics and everything like that. Mm-hmm. And I think this is another theory. It's just a theory. No one at YouTube has confirmed this, but I think that how YouTube knows what video you made is by using the data of who watches your content. Mm -hmm. So like more than like your tags and stuff. Yeah. More Mm -hmm. than your tags, your tags are maybe like a starting place, but they're endorsed by the people who visit your video. Like let's say I do a woodworking video and everyone who comes and watches and stays engaged through the whole thing, maybe leaves a like, maybe leaves a comment. They also like woodworking like videos in general. That's going to be an endorsement by your viewers that your content is woodworking. Yeah. Well, where is it going? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. But okay, okay. The, the 80% of views that we were driving drove the additional 20% because yes. those 80% brought in viewers, brought in data, gave Google the information they needed to make Properly a judgment index it. about our video, and then yeah. they could start serving it. Yes. 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 So we've talked about this a little bit, um, but community involvement is very important for promoting your video. So not just like when you launch it, but also to keep reminding people of your channel. Every time you update or upload a new video, you can post about it on your various social channels. And um, But not only that, I think being just a present and involved person in the community Mm -hmm. helps. You know, people will see your username over and over again if you're being interactive in your community, and that's a reminder every time. And then if they see a YouTube video pop up, and they're like, oh, that's that person that I keep seeing in all the comments on all the people I follow. They're more likely to click it than if they have no idea who you are. And, of course, never be pushy. Never sub for sub. Never. never. like never. One like equals two subscribes or whatever. Like, don't, 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 don't. Don't do any of that. Be be helpful. Helpful, positive, positive. or like, you know, whatever. Like, contribute to provide value. 
mm-hmm. that's going to be the way to get positive attention as opposed to fickle attention. Yes. Or just being blocked. <laughs> yeah, that too. I think another thing is like, and uh, this probably depends on the types of videos you're making, but a lot of communities will have things like challenges you can yeah. participate in. So like one of the first things we did, um, there's a maker podcast called the modern maker podcast and they had a two, two by four challenge. And a lot of people entered and submitted videos and, um, participating in that, it definitely gave us a boost and introduced us to a lot more people. And that video became our most watched video for a while. Um, yeah. you know, until we continue to like keep growing and move and keep going. But, um, I think that's a really great way to, get extra eyeballs, but also just continue to form relationships in the community. Cause you'll, you'll start to like get to know and you'll start to follow the other people participating and like, it can just lead to genuine relationships. And speaking of those genuine relationships, one way to really establish those even more is to go to events. That's one mm-hmm. thing we really enjoy doing in general. And I think that like, we meeting- just talked about events like a, a lot in our last podcast so yeah. if you want like more thoughts on that we'll link to it but yeah but in general it is it's good to get involved like maybe volunteer maybe like you know meet up with some of those people you you interacted with in that last challenge you know have meals with people and that can strengthen those bonds in general mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. so another way to grow is collaborations and i i we get asked about collaborations a lot because we've actually done um probably more than most people who considering like the young age of our channel. Yeah, we've done a lot. We've done a lot of collaborations as well. We're weird. <laughs> Last year we did a maybe, lot. Maybe a little bit too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so we get asked about it a lot. And I think my biggest tip with collaborations is it's, it's not a guaranteed thing that all of a sudden your channel is just going to grow like crazy. It might happen. You might not grow at all. And so I think only do a collaboration if you just want to do it because you are friends with this person and it's going to be fun. And if you guys both grow awesome. And if you don't, that's cool. You still had a week of hanging out with, you know, some with a friend that you wouldn't have been hanging out with otherwise. Yeah, And I think that one of the biggest values we've gotten from collaborations in general is just learning skills, like watching mm-hmm. other people work, not like just working with like, you know, making, cause we're, we're, we're involved with a lot of makers and but like stuff. the backend business side. Yeah. Of things. It's so like crazy. How, how much people film, seeing someone film and then seeing the final product of their edited video mm. is very eye opening or seeing, mm. or, you know, having a chance to talk to somebody about sponsors or having the chance to talk to someone about how they keep track of projects and all that stuff. You know, it, it can happen at events too, but when you're doing a collaboration, there's a lot more one-on-one time together. And so you can go much deeper into it. But I think people think that it's just like this magic thing and therefore they propose a collaboration and it comes off like it's only for the purpose of growing. So I think if you want, if you do want to collaborate with someone, you need to make sure that you and that other person have an actual real relationship first, Mm -hmm. you know? And like also maybe if you're smaller than the channel you want to collaborate with, Bring add some value. Bring something to the table. Yeah, yeah. like re- reduce their workload or help out in some way or... Or do something that, you know, provide something that they might not have been able to do on their own. Like if you're an expert in something, then you can bring that to the table. Yeah. 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 All right. So in terms of the technical stuff, like the back end, the... Na- anal- <laughs> <laughs> keep going you're doing you're doing great the analytics <laughs> the analytics <laughs> words are so hard um we, we were just going to kind of not breeze over them a little bit because i think that there are videos that touch on this deeper and better mm-hmm. do your research i know that's kind of like a little bit of a cop-out but we'll touch on a few little things here and there yeah yeah so i think that one of the things is use a lot of the systems that are in place like youtube puts these systems in place and if you're not taking advantage of them, then you're leaving things on the table. I think one of the things that we've started doing now that I think is really important is putting time into your closed captions, especially now that YouTube starts auto-playing videos on the homepage and what shows up in the video are closed captions. Yeah. Also, closed captions are um, one of the things that YouTube indexes when they're trying to like figure out what type of video you have. So, of course, there's things like keywords but captions are another opportunity also 
auto closed captions are not always the best. Like <laughs> they think that we are vulgar people. <laughs> yes, they think we curse like sailors, and we do not curse in our videos. But that could, if auto captions are picking up cursing in your videos, and you don't go in and manually correct it, it might YouTube might think that your channel isn't appropriate for all audiences. Yeah. So it might not show you to everybody. So that's definitely one uh, one kind of back end thing. To, yeah. To tackle another thing that you can do is uh, especially like in the beginning if you're relying on like search to bring in viewers and especially stuff especially if you're an educational channel or you're doing something that maybe is trending right now that a lot of people are searching for yeah do your research on like keywords like what if diy bookends is better than um like wooden bookends or uh that's not the best example <laughs> <laughs> but yeah but that like like one thing we we learned again you know we started as a diy channel um we learned that often how to has a lot more search than DIY, which I would not have expected. And but it might also, not be yeah. the same right now. It changes, but it's just one of those things to look into. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think also things like make sure you have a channel trailer. Yeah. That you may not need it immediately when you first launch your channel. Cause oftentimes you need footage from other videos to incorporate into a channel trailer. Not always, but I think it helps. Um, but as soon as you feel comfortable doing that, I think that's another good thing to, yeah. To add to your channel. I think have playlists too. Like if on your homepage, all it is is that single default bar of videos. It looks it, very empty. It looks very empty. And you might have 100 videos, but when someone goes to your homepage, they only see five or four or whatever it is. Well, and if you have like playlists with like descriptions in the playlists, which mm -hmm. are also searchable, by the way. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, fill it out, flush things out. Also with playlists, um, because... A good thing about playlist is you are controlling what the person is going to see next mm, if they just mm -hmm. let things autoplay. So instead of watching your video and then seeing a bunch of other people's videos, they're more likely to stay watching your video if yeah. they're watching from a playlist. So playlists are great to put in like the end cards of your videos. Then it'll get people on like a track of videos mm -hmm. instead of one or like in the links in description or wherever you're putting links in general. Playlists are better than a single video. Yes. Yes. And I think that everyone knows this, but like on the technical side, the thumbnail is so dang important. Oh, it's it's more important than any of the <laughs> other like back end YouTube stuff we've mentioned in this section. Yeah, I, I know that we kind of get sucked down the rabbit hole of like trying to find the perfect thumbnail. Oh, it takes hours sometimes. sometimes I put on we just makeup like... today just so that we could <laughs> take pictures for a thumbnail. <laughs> Not for this podcast audience. No, you know I don't wear makeup on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's um it's it's really important and like it also conveys so much about your video or yeah. at least people like assume it does. You yeah. Know? So for so for example, one one thing that um, we have been figuring out again because we transitioned from more instructional to more entertainment is uh, most instructional DIY channels the photo or the thumbnail is going to be a photo of the finished product mm -hmm. that sends a message to the person clicking like here is what you're clicking for. If you want to learn how to make this, here's the thing. And when we started doing, or when we started shifting more towards entertainment, um, and we always had a little bit of entertainment in there, but the more and more we shift, the more we started realizing that that doesn't necessarily work. Like people don't want to see how it turns out in the very beginning. Cause, Cause it's not as good of a story. It's like, cause, cause it's they're like there, a spoiler. Cause, Cause they're there for the journey. They're not there for the finished product. Yes. You know where, but if you're, giving instructions people don't want to invest time in the video unless they know what they're watching for so i think just know that like like get into the mindset of the audience you want to reach with your videos and don't just apply a default rule that you think is right because other people who make similar videos are doing yeah. it and you can always like again going back to the social platforms you can always do polls you can always do mm -hmm. you like ask, ask your friends and family and also, like, knowing what type of content you're making, going all the way back to the very beginning, do your research, look at other channels that are doing well in your same type of field, and look at, like, how they structure their thumbnails and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, for example, like, if you're doing entertainment-based videos, it's, you know, it can be important to have a face in your thumbnail because reactions are more important than the thing you're reacting to. Now, keep in mind, there also has to be like a strong cohesiveness between the thumbnail, the title, and the content. That kind of goes Clickbait, back to the yeah. um, consistency and expectations. Yeah, but also it's like on the analytical and technical side of things, if you have like this crazy thumbnail and a crazy title, you're like most extreme wipeouts ever. And it's like 
a, a kid falling over in their cart or something like that. You know, <laughs> ah, actually, that might that but, might be pretty good. Maybe but, it's maybe it's um, a whiteboard and you wipe it off. It's yeah. an extreme wipeout. Ah, um, right, get it. That actually, those that are two well. actually really good <laughs> ideas. Dang it! But like you know, you know like if, if someone clicks in and they immediately click out, what signal does that send to YouTube? That, tells YouTube that your thumbnail and title were misleading. Yeah, and if someone searches for most extreme wipeouts, they see your your title and thumbnail, they click it, they go in, and they go right back out. Guess where your video is going next? Not there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it won't be in the the search for much longer. You know yeah. what I mean? So there has to be that cohesiveness because. In the end, YouTube is trying to like deliver high quality content that's sticky, that delivers, and that's accurate. And you don't want to send false messages. Yes. 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 So another thing to keep in mind is scheduling. And there's a lot of um, different opinions on this. So we'll just share what we found works for us mm -hmm. and why. Um, we like to have a little bit of a schedule. And by a little bit, I mean a lot of bit <laughs> of, a, of a schedule. It helps drive things. It helps keep us on schedule. It helps standardize things. With... Our schedule keeps us on schedule. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but also it, like it it, it it adds an end point because I think especially with this one right here, <laughs> if we didn't have a schedule, <laughs> should just want to keep on refining it forever, and it would be it's hard true. to ever call it done. It's true. It's it's uh, that's very true. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I think there's like. And it, again, it probably depends on your personality, but for us, there are good internal reasons to have a schedule, but I feel like there's also good external reasons. So the internal, like you said, it helps, it keeps us from putting too much time into one video. It also keeps us from taking breaks, <laughs> which maybe we need more breaks. Um, but it, we, we can produce a lot more because we know every Friday there's got to be a video yeah. out. But also you can schedule in breaks. Mm. Yeah, you can schedule. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> yes. But I think externally it helps make your videos more of a habit mm -hmm. for people watching. Because if, you know, in the same way, like, you know, when The Office came on Thursday nights, I knew Thursday nights I was going to watch The Office. If Evan and Caitlin, you know, release a video Fridays, like Friday mornings, then I know that's what I'm doing Friday morning. Yeah, or even if it's Saturday morning or Sunday morning, you well, can I mean, build the transitions around whatever time it is. Yeah, It doesn't matter what it is. I'm just saying, yeah. like, you pick your, your day. Yeah, and then you know, whatever day that is, you go and watch that content, and then you're not as reliant on the subscriber bell and the notifications and all of the systems that YouTube has in place that sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, might change. But if you know, every weekend I watch this, this, and this, Mm -hmm. You know, then you'll then seek it out. Even you'll if, seek it out. Yeah. Even if YouTube isn't sending you a notification. Whereas, like, if you're publishing like once a month or once every two months, you might like not know that someone has published a piece of content, and you won't go search it out. Or maybe they publish once a month for a couple months, and then they publish five in a, in a week. Yeah. yeah. You know, you're you might not catch all those five because you're only expecting one a month. Yeah, and and you know, one a month still has a good. It's not a bad approach necessarily. No, I don't think it's a bad yeah. approach to do one a month. Mark Rober does one a month. I just yeah. think it's he's doing one a month consistently. Yeah, he's he, and he's not all of a sudden like jumping up to multiple. Yeah, you're right. Or skipping yeah. tons of months yeah. in between. Yeah, but like being that, consistent in general. And that's not to say you can't take breaks. We take buffer weeks sometimes where we like continue to work. We and we still do podcasts and gaming videos, but we don't do our main channel videos so yeah. that we can get ahead. And so. Don't feel like the schedule has to rule your like, life. <laughs> rule your life, but I think it does help add a little structure. And I think it's really hard to do that at the beginning, especially yeah. if you're not seeing the growth that you want. You know, it feels like your content's going into a black hole. But I think that like <laughs> it's 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 pretty important then to to kind of like think of yourself as like a full time content creator and like put in that work and effort. Because mm -hmm. if you don't, then you probably won't see that growth. Yeah, and I think that's one of the hard things because you might only be getting a few views on a video that took X amount of hours to make. Mm -hmm. And a, a year, year from now, your videos might take the same amount of hours to make, but you get thousands of views. Yeah. But in that, that first period, you're doing the same amount of work for nothing and, or for what feels like nothing. And so it's easy to get demotivated. And yeah. to not want to put on the time, to not want to, you know, put out as many videos as you can. Yeah, but like going back to that drywall video that we talked about earlier, that was the very, like in the first batch of four videos, it was in that batch. And that for the longest time was our number one by far watch video. And it's still in the top five, right? 
top five to like five to seven or something. Five to seven, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, still it's still way going. up there. It's still going. And it's, it, it, yeah, it was the second video we filmed and edited. And it was in that initial batch when yeah. we had no subscribers and yeah. no views. And no money coming from it. But it's been monetized <laughs> since. And it's er- like slowly putting it, bringing in that residual yeah. money, you know? So, so I think like, just think of those things. Think of the potential of your videos, even when people aren't seeing them initially. Yeah. And after covering... All of that, I think we're going to like go back around to dealing with change. It's it's something that we've dealt with some, and it was a little bit painful. Like at the end of 2018, we started experimenting with some different types of videos because that's what we knew we wanted long term. We knew that that would make us happy long term, mm-hmm. and we didn't exactly know how to mesh the type of content or make that transition. And we dealt with it by just like grinding on through it, dealing with the slightly less performing videos, learning those lessons. And eventually we emerged out the other side and everything has been so much better since we kind of successfully made that transition. And And we have, we have podcasts where we talk about the transition a lot more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll link link them below. Yeah. But like, it's it's something to keep in mind. And, and also maybe people who are watching this have a channel that they've been going at for a while and, you and know, maybe they want to change. My, yeah. And, and uh, I don't know how much there is to say about it just because we went through it and it's going to be unique for every single channel and stuff. But mm-hmm. I think that knowing it's a possibility, knowing it does cost something, but in the long term, if you're making the change for yourself and for those right reasons, it's worth it. All right. I think that brings us to monetization. <sighs> okay. So before we go into like, monetization and how to monetize your videos. I just want to share like a little bit of a back end on how we transitioned from full-time and part-time to, well, our old jobs to our new jobs and like how we did that. Because most people who are going to be doing YouTube as a career, they generally also have to like think about how they're going to make that transition financially. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the tips that we have developed and we've thought about will help you make that transition less painful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, Um, I used to work as an engineer. We talked about it more in a previous episode. It seems like it's a theme. Like this is like, we've talked (laughs) about a lot on this podcast. (laughs) We have. And, um, you know, when I was working as an engineer, um, we knew we wanted to make this transition. So I kind of went to consulting to kind of supplement that income and make the transition less painful. Well, you, you switched from full time to consulting. Yes. Yeah. There was no income (laughs) from YouTube. Yeah, there was no income at the beginning. And <laughs> so there, you were supplementing was, any yeah. income now, which is, was the income. <laughs> supplementing our income of zero dollars. Of zero dollars. <laughs> but the reason that you went to consulting is because then you had a little bit more control over your schedule. Yeah, and I got paid more per hour. And the main thing we're trying to do is cut down the hours of our old jobs and increase the hours of YouTube. So that was like one option that was open to me. Yeah, and I was a graphic designer and I switched – from working 40 hours a week to working 30 hours a week to working 20 hours a week <laughs> to being uh, talked to by my team saying, hey, you either need to come back to full time or you need to quit so we can hire someone else. And I was like, well, I'm quitting. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's that between you um, reducing your hours on a consulting basis from going like five days a week to four to three to two to one and me reducing my hours per week, we were able to gear up the channel and still maintain some income. Now it was still, it was still kind of scary. Um, because you know, we at a certain point didn't have health insurance anymore and had to figure that out. And we just had Um, to bite the bullet and pay for it. (laughs) Yeah. And you know, you do, even though there's part of you that's like, well, I can always go back to another job and we or to our old jobs or a similar job. And we did feel that way. It's just still a little scary, but I think being able to ease into that transition made it mm. a lot less scary than just both of us quitting our jobs on the same day and going from full-time jobs to no income, Yeah, you know? And another reason why we want to share this story is because for both of us, this was very unconventional at our companies. No one no at Kaylin's company it. was doing what she was doing. No one at my company was doing what I was doing. But we we made it happen because it was a priority for us. Mm-hmm. And in the end, even though reducing our hours at our jobs was scary, the thing that scared us honestly more was looking into the future and knowing that we didn't do everything that we could to make this, like give it the best shot possible. That was yeah. scarier to us than the transition. 
Yeah, 100%. Um, and yeah, and like you said, this wasn't a conventional path. So I guess the advice there is don't be afraid to ask for something, even if other people aren't doing it. The worst that someone can say is no. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's how we transitioned from full-time to part-time to YouTube. Or, old, yeah, like you yeah. said, old jobs to YouTube. <laughs> um, but we still had to figure out how to make YouTube actually make money because, like, growth, there's a whole bunch of strategies on growth, but there's also separate strategies in terms of how to actually make money from your growth, especially yeah. if you're not relying on AdSense alone. Yeah, and I think that like the two big tips that we have are early on, diversify, and start with baby steps earlier on than you might think. Because Yeah, we started monetizing really early. Yeah, like at 30,000 like 30, subscribers? Yeah, we had our first sponsor at 30,000 yeah. subscribers. And the reason why you do that early is because <clears throat> things might not go smoothly, and honestly, it's better to learn that when you're smaller than when you're a lot bigger. You know, like the bigger you are, the bigger you fall type <laughs> analogy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's more at risk. There's more at risk, basically. When you're bigger. Yeah. I think that's one reason. I think another reason is if, um, if, if implementing that type of monetization is a goal of yours, the early, earlier you start building that portfolio, mm. the easier it is to continue to build yeah on both sides on the advertiser side and from your viewers because mm -hmm. if you're you've you've grown a whole bunch and your viewers are used to no no sponsorships and everything like that and you start throwing them in then that's a change you know and it's maybe an unwelcome one but if you know people know from the beginning that that's how you've been able to make videos and how you're able to make more videos or better quality videos or yeah. what have you then and that's part of your identity then it won't be as big of a negative in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and, and it's interesting. We got a comment um, today on one of our videos, and I could tell it was someone new to the channel yeah. because they said, man, these guys aren't even 400,000 subscribers, and they already have sponsors. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, well, <laughs> it's actually very common in the maker community. But it's like we we started so early on that for our regular viewers, it's like – not even a thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just, it's just this is just how we pay our bills. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? And also it's like the the earlier you start working with these companies, the the easier it will be for you to understand the contracts, how to negotiate, how to reach out. Um and also the more brand deals you do and advertising that you do, um it's like kind of a portfolio because the more mm -hmm. you put advertisements into your videos, the more you can show off how you do that in a way that you know hopefully creates a win-win-win all the way around for the advertiser. They are being shown to the right community. The community is being shown something in a fun way or being exposed to a new product. And for you, you're like naturally tying these two people together mm -hmm. and hopefully everything works out hunky-dory and happy-happy. And I want to clarify two things real quick. One, when you say advertiser, you're talking about sponsors. Sponsors, yeah. So that's like brands that we're working directly with, not advertisers that are advertising on YouTube. Yes, yes, yes. Another yes. thing, we need to backtrack a lot because <laughs> we sorry. just started going down the sponsor <laughs> yeah, rabbit hole. Yeah, but uh, but yeah. point one was diversify. So I feel like we could talk a little bit about like the different ways that we make money. Yeah, okay, let's break and then, it down. And then we can go deeper into the meat. In each one. Okay, yeah. so let's break it down like top level. Where do we pers personally, like collectively make money for Evan and Caitlin. So 60% are from sponsors. Yes. 15% Patreon. F 15. What did I say? Well, you said 15, but it just, sometimes it's hard to tell if someone's saying 50 or 15. <laughs> okay. 60% from sponsors, 15% from Patreon, 15, 15. <laughs> from AdSense, six from affiliates <laughs> and four from merch. Yes. So that's the breakdown for us. And you know, I think that's actually all of it. Yeah, I mean, there's like little things like we could like a tiny amount from plan Twitch. sales or a Twitch, tiny amount from yeah. plan sales, um, and everyone is gonna do it differently, and you might change. Like in the beginning, we we also sold products, yeah, like uh, physical things that we made. So, and I think that a huge part of like our like community in general are selling plans. Like some people, that's like their entire income, you know. Yeah, and for us, we have like a couple plans or you can sell. sell books or online classes or like you can have a really successful website where you sell space on there or, or you do a lot of public speaking yeah, and yeah. you get 
paid to do talks. Yeah. But I think, um, I, I think like testing all of these again, and if you test it a little bit when you're smaller, it's, it's a little bit easier because the risks are lower. You do have to like learn the ins and outs of each one again and again and again. As you get bigger? No, no, no. Like, like, um, so it's like, let's say you figure out sponsors and you're like, yay, I figured that out. Then you also had to figure out affiliate and you also had to figure out merch. But I yeah, think that, you know, <laughs> it's just an investment of your time. It is worth it. It's worth it to like put the time in and, and figure that out. And you may test something out. Like you may try Patreon and say, this is not for me. I, I don't feel comfortable with the amount of value that I'm providing to these people that are paying me money and and i want to pull out or you might be like us and be like i freaking love patreon our patrons are so awesome well, before we dive into each individual one i was just using patreon yeah. as an example of things that you like like you might try something and not like yeah. it or you might try something and love yeah. it so it's worth it to try right. lots of things well actually i was about to say before we dive into something let's, let's actually dive into each one individually <laughs> <laughs> <Never Okay. mind. laughs> so let's start with sponsors because i feel like that's kind of Pretty complicated, and it's a big one for a lot it's of probably, people, including us. It's probably the one we get asked about most. Yeah, probably because it is. It, it sponsors can allow you to go full time with your channel long before you'd be able to otherwise. Any like, other way, yeah. It, like if we didn't have any sponsors, we might just now be able to go full time. Yeah, and that's so crazy. No, I think you're right. If we hadn't have gone down the sponsor route early on, yeah, we would be going full time now. And instead of making 120 videos in our career so far, we would have made. Less. Yeah. <laughs> a lot less. <laughs> a lot less. So I think one of the hardest things is like, how do you connect with sponsors? How do you, you reach you, out to you them? You reach out to them. Like, like, sorry. Well, yes. so it's like, that's what like, I was going to say. <laughs> sorry. But like, uh, I, like, we are definitely strong advocates for like taking the first step in that relationship. I know a lot of people say like, no, wait for them to come to you because you get more bargaining power. And there might be some small truth in that. But at the same time, like choosing who you want to work with is so important to us because being able to give a genuine endorsement of a company or mm -hmm. a product makes things so much easier and feel good. It's like I, I, I love so many of the sponsors we work with and it feels nice to be able to give them like a like, I don't know. Yeah. Well, also, I think like kind of like what we were, we were saying in the beginning, when you don't have any track record with sponsors, they're mm -hmm. probably not going to reach out to you. You might get reached out for someone wanting to send you a free product, but it's it, it can be hard to convince somebody to pay you when you don't have a track record yet. So the, you can you can start working with them earlier on if you reach out as opposed to just waiting them to waiting for them to find you. Yeah, And, and honestly, like it does take time. There is it a does. cost to it. But at the same time, who knows when that brand will just somehow find you? You know, it's like, it's like yeah. going to a bar and like looking cute in a corner or something and like <laughs> hoping someone just like, <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure if that way makes the most <laughs> sense, but just like, uh, hoping that <laughs> someone comes over and tells you you're cute. Yeah. <laughs> is, is that what you do? Going up. It's, it's been a long time since either of us have been single. <laughs> it's been a long time. <laughs> I, I would have thought that you were cute in the oh, corner. Oh, thank you. I would have thought that you're very cute too, but I probably wouldn't have gone up and approached you because I'm shy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but yeah, I, yeah, I think, um, you can start working with sponsors earlier if you reach out. And of course, the earlier you reach out, the less you're going to get paid because you're yeah. not pulling in as many views. But we were okay with that in order to like get practice yeah, and, and start like, forming relationships. I think that in terms of reaching out, it, it really helps to engage with a brand a little bit before you just send them a message out of the blue, you know, like tag them on social media, comment on their things. Like, because the person who decides the social media campaigns is probably going to be tied somehow in with the social media, like accounts and everything like that. So, you know, get engaged with the brands, especially like when you're first starting out and everything, and then maybe send them a DM, send them a message, like look up their contact information via like press releases or what have you, you know, like be proactive about things, but also don't be pushy and weird. Don't be pushing weird, but I'm going to, um, you kind of breezed over this, um, how we reach out to them. Yeah. Like yeah. where we reach out to them part yeah. is DMS, but, um, a big one is like press releases, 
because a lot of times there's an email on the press release and that's someone who is on the marketing team for the company. Yeah. You can also do some light stalking on LinkedIn. <laughs> or if you're going to events again, you're not only meeting people, you might meet some, meet some brands companies. that you're really excited about and you're like, hey, I love your product. I'd love to do something with you. Let's form a relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and be really positive. And I think that one thing that um, you want to do is like, Think about things from the brand's perspective. They're probably being approached all the time and you want to stand out and you want to make things an easy yes. You know, like tell a story like, hey, I've been using your products for eight years and I love them and I'd love to share the story and I have this project that'll show off your, your product really well and make it so that they can say yes. Yeah. As, so Instead that, of lots of back and forths, you know? Yeah, you don't want to say, you don't just want to email and say, hey, would you like to work with me? <laughs> you know, like you want to give them reasons to say yes and feels like you actually put an effort into it. Yeah, yeah. I think another side of the coin with sponsors that a lot of people have trouble with is figuring out how much to charge because you want to be fair to the company, but mm -hmm. you also don't want to get completely ripped off, mm -hmm. you know? So yes. it's the way we go about it is kind of fairly standard practice in the industry, mm -hmm. but you kind of go by a cost per thousand views. It's called a CPM, cost per meal. Cost per meal. Cost per meal. Yeah, <laughs> and, and it's the cost per thousand views in the first 30 days yeah, of a video's yeah. life. And the views of the last 10 or so average performing videos. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, we, we have like a calculator for ourselves. Yep. But so you just have to figure out what that CPM is for you. And then it makes pricing yourself really easy. And, and CPMs won't necessarily be consistent between bigger and smaller channels because the bigger someone is, it, it might be hard to charge the same CPM when you're when you are getting millions of views as it was when you were getting hundreds of views because it doesn't scale like you can outprice yourself yeah um so and it also depends on the industry like gaming might totally. have a different cpm mm -hmm. than diy that you know fashion and you know yeah, lifestyle etc booty community booty community probably has a pretty high cpm probably has pretty high cpm <laughs> um but yeah so talk to people who are around your same size because that's going to be a better measure of what you should be charging rather than talking to someone who's 10 times your size. And it also depends on the type of advertisement. Is it product placement? Is it um, full talking points? Are the talking points at the very beginning or are they at the end or are they in the middle? How long are they? Are you going to have to be exclusive with the brand? You might need to build in some CPM for that. Um, all these things play it sounds, into it. It sounds very overwhelming listing all of the factors. But that's why you start yeah. early. You start, you start early. early. You get that experience. You 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 figure out what is costly to you and what stressful. isn't costly. It's very stressful when it's like mm. the difference of thousands of dollars on the line oh, because yeah. you realize you should have charged more if you had to say the ad up front yeah. rather than the ad at the but end. But in the but beginning, it's going to be a difference in the beginning, of if it's a tens 50, or yeah, hundreds Yeah, maybe. if it's like $50 difference, then you're kind of like, oh, well, you know. <laughs> you know. No, now I know No for later. big loss for me, yeah. Yeah. And exactly. in general, just to give you a general range to start at, maybe between 15 and 50 CPM. Yeah. So you take that 15 or 50, you multiply it by the average views in the first 30 days of your past 10 videos. Yeah. And then that's how you get your price. Yeah. So for us, like product placements are on the lower end and sponsorships with talking points, so, you know, 60 second talking points are on the higher end. Yeah. And you just kind of like figure out what works for you. Yeah. 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 Okay, cool. So let's go over to Patreon because we love Patreon. We do love Patreon. We, and this is something that we started fairly early on too. And you know what? From the beginning, we were invested in it. We had a vision for it. We wanted to build up a community there. And we put in, we put in as much effort from the beginning compared to now. What are words? <laughs> Can you say that again? <laughs> yeah, we, we put the same amount of effort in the beginning as we do now, even though there are a lot less people. And it's kind of that's kind of consistent with the videos. Mm -hmm. You put mm -hmm. in effort as if this is your full time one hundred percent thing from the very beginning, even when you're not really getting much out of it. Because you want to like establish yourself in a good place from the beginning. And, you know, let's say let's say what you do for your patrons, you know, one thing we do is we record an after show after every video. It takes us the same amount of time to record that after show if there's two patrons or two hundred patrons. So 
Um, you just have to be okay with that in the beginning if that's the kind of thing you want to pursue. And it's also a lot easier to see the value when you're small and when you're beginning because when you aren't getting that much money from anything, Patreon, you know, is, is a really great option. But as soon as you're like really, really big, starting over from zero on a new platform, it's kind of a lot harder. Yeah, because you it's know? harder to justify the time you're putting into this new uh, thing when you already know how to make a lot of money yeah. on these other things. And one That's huge true. advantage of Patreon as opposed to like sponsors or AdSense or anything else is Patreon is very consistent. It's super consistent. It, it feels so nice knowing that our patrons are there supporting us. It's like a safety net. <laughs> it's a safety net, yeah. And I think there's a couple different ways you can go about Patreon. Um, so we talked to a lot of different people about how they do it and I've kind of narrowed it down to three different ways. It can just kind of be a donation box where you say, Hey, I have this Patreon. You, if you want to donate to me to help support the channel, this is where you go. Um, there's not necessarily any rewards. It's just a donation box. Yeah, so it's like lower effort, but also lower payback, lower effort, lower payback. Then there's the type of Patreon that offers one time rewards. So that's like, if you, sign up to become a patron, you get a t-shirt or you get a sticker or um, things like that, that you have to, as the content creator, you have to deliver those rewards once per patron, um, but then never again. I think the benefits of those are there's not as much maintenance per patron, but you do have to keep, it does like your effort has to scale Mm -hmm. with the amount of patrons. So maybe it's not a big deal to send shirts if you're only getting a few new patrons a month, but if you're getting like a few every day, that could be a lot of work. It could be, yeah. The other way is offering ongoing rewards that are not divvied out on an individual basis. They are like uh, given as a group. So that's kind of what we do. Um, because it scales well. It scales well. And it is a lot more work, especially in the beginning, again, when you don't have that many people. But we do things like after show videos, we do behind the scenes posts, we do monthly video chat calls with our top patrons. And these are things that I feel very comfortable in our ability to scale mm -hmm. and that, that works well with us. And a bonus is I feel like we have like a good relationship with our patrons. Yep, I think that ties up Patreon. I think that going over to AdSense, I'm not sure if there's much we can really share. I mean, most people seem to understand this. You get more views, you get more money. And depending on like the type of channel you run, you might get sli slightly well, higher CPM or slightly that's, lower CPM. That's what's interesting oh. is that people's CPM varies. It's it not just like a standard CPM across the board no, for no, all no. YouTubers. No, no, no. So it's like, yeah, the type of content you make and also the time of the year. You know, in mm -hmm. December, it's higher when more companies are spending money. And in January, before their budgets are approved and everything, it's lower. It's a lot lower. That's so why lots of YouTubers take vacations in January. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little side bonus knowledge there. <laughs> um, but like, there's, it's just, it is what it is. Yeah, you're, you're, it's not going to be as much of an issue if you have family friendly content. From yeah. what we've gathered, I mean, YouTube doesn't like publish a it's, lot of this stuff. Yeah. It's a lot of speculation, but. So I think we can go into affiliate a little bit more because really affiliate is a perfect type of income source for channels like us where we're buying things, showing how they're used and making things with them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like basically affiliate like income works by you put a link in your description or in your wherever you put links and every time it's like a referral, you know, it's like yeah. someone clicks it, they buy it and you get like a small percentage back from the seller. Yeah, so like we use Amazon affiliates a lot. It's because, really easy to start with. Yeah, we're it's super it's super easy to apply, um, and it's very easy to get the links you need. Yeah. Now, one one tip we did get from someone who started this started a channel and they started doing affiliate like very early. If you start an affiliate account with Amazon and you don't sell enough right away, you might have to reapply. You might need to reapply later. But um, it wasn't something we had issues with. I mean, it might be different because we were a maker channel. So it might be different because we were a maker people channel. People yeah. were more likely to click on our um, affiliate links because we were saying, here's the thing we made. Here's the tools and materials we used to make it. Yeah. This is more incentive to click. Or it you might can depend like, on your channel. Yeah, or you can list the, the camera you use or your mm -hmm. gear or whatever it is. So you can kind of tailor it to your own channel a little bit. Mm -hmm. But if you're like, a travel vlog, it could be like your backpack and your water bottle. But it's such an easy win-win-win for everybody because the people watching want to know what you use, mm -hmm. you provide it, the company gets the sale, and you get some income. It's, yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. Yeah. 
yeah. There you All go. Right. So merch. Let's go on to merch. Um, so I think there's two types of merch fulfillment in general. Um, print on demand or carrying stock yourself. Yeah, we opt for print on demand. We started carrying our own stock <laughs> and it's surprisingly difficult to estimate what you're going to need even when you only have one design I'm and laughing one color. Like, we got it so far off. We didn't know like how many men's to order, how many women's, what sizes. And those were the only variables. Yeah. It was one yeah. We had we only one had design. one design and we got it wrong. Yeah. Very so, wrong. So what that told us is that print on demand is a lot easier and also when you're you know it can totally be cheaper to order your own stock but it's only cheaper if you can guess it right and yeah. order a lot of it at once at the smaller quantities we were ordering it wasn't necessarily a better deal than us just doing it print on demand yeah because we were also, getting not huge batches you also have to let factor in the the cost of your own time like yeah. should you be fulfilling merch or should you be making more videos and like the disruption of like shipping out a single shirt in a day. Yeah. It's, it might be more than you think. <laughs> it's <laughs> we like, really like another didn't thing. <laughs> like shipping stuff. <laughs> we, we don't. Shipping is like so much more of a pain and more expensive you gotta than you might think at all. You got to thing. You got to get the package. Well, Amazon completely spoils everybody because like Amazon, just, it's just free. It's like two day and like people expect that and it's not that. <laughs> but I guess like uh, print on demand, it's, it's very easy. There's no... Um, limit on the amount of designs you can do. Whereas if you're carrying your own stock, every design you add adds another variable you have to guess about. Mm. Um, so it's what works best for us. We use Printful. We'll put a link to them in the description. It'll probably be an affiliate link. It will. <laughs> <laughs> um, most of our links will be affiliate links as it is listed. We will yes. say they're affiliate. Um, but yeah, I think I think that's like kind of the basics of March. Yeah. Again, we're getting into things that it, for most people, it, it will be a smaller portion of your income. Not everybody. We know some people who the majority of their income comes from merch. Yeah. But I feel like when you're getting started, merch will be not a huge yeah. part and probably not something you need to deal with immediately. Yeah. And I think that those those topics probably cover all of the like most widely applicable ways of earning money. Don't you think? Well, I mean, I wouldn't say like merch is widely applicable. They're the ways that we earn money. They're the ways that we earn money. I think, but I think, that I like, think Patreon and sponsors and AdSense are yeah. probably the most widely applicable. But like and products and plan sales and Twitch and everything, those are kind of more niche. Yeah, and we're not as experienced. We, yeah, as experienced with us. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we're going to okay. move on. So balancing everything that we've talked about, let's like talk on that a little bit before we wrap up. Um, okay, yeah. I so, think that. Because there's definitely a balance between like, your monetization, mm -hmm. your channel growth, and how, how sustainable, sustainable it is. everything is. You can't is. have all of those. <laughs> I mean, you can have one or maybe two, <laughs> but you can't be, like at the beginning, you can't be sustainable, good monetization, and good growth, unless you're very lucky or skilled. Yeah, I, I think like, I think at the beginning, growth is more important than monetization. Yes. Sustainability, or growth is probably more important than sustainability <laughs> yeah, in the I, beginning. I agree. Because like we were working our butts off for a really long time and we, it feels like we're not now, but then we remind ourselves like, oh yeah, we still work on weekends and from the time we wake up till the time we go to bed. Yeah. So we are still working our butts off compared to most people. And so, um, uh, sustainability in terms of like how much you work. I mean, I think that's something all YouTubers like, struggle, struggle with, with yeah. a little bit. That's why but there's think, so many burnout videos yeah, nowadays. But I, think, I think in the beginning, growth should be what you focus on. When you're getting to the point where you um, foresee your ability to make the switch to full time, that's when monetization kicks in. Can kick in and become a bigger priority. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think you should ever monetize to the detriment of growth, because growth is a long term thing. Any any single sponsored video, that's a short term thing. Yeah. Um, and I think last comes sustainability because <laughs> you also have to like think about like the sustainable methods of income. You need to like figure out how many videos you can make and balance your life in general. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one point that we're getting to now, like two we're and a half years in. We're figuring out that in. part. Yeah. <laughs> but in general, like building up that library of content that will continue to bring in views, continue to bring in that growth. That's mm -hmm. really important. And then diversify all of your incomes, not having everything in like all your eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. I think both of those are really important. And I think that's kind of mainly it. We went through it all. Yeah, it yes. only took us like two hours. 
yes <laughs> a little bit longer than we thought <sighs> but like oh man i've been we've been wanting to make this podcast for so long yeah it was going to be a video and then we you know did it as a couple talks and then it was going to be a podcast and then it just wasn't happening so <laughs> i'm i'm glad cuz cuz we do want to share the things that we've learned you know there's a lot of growing pains in the beginning we don't want people to experience the pain we experienced (laughs) (laughs) if there's something that we can like a struggle we can help prevent we want to help prevent it yeah Um, and also i think in general there are so many awesome people out there like you guys are awesome and you guys have important knowledge or you're funny and there's like people that you can connect with online and i think that youtube is such an exciting place to, to be, to be a part of the community. And I think it'd be great to get more people in on this and like build everyone up. I think that this is definitely like a rising tides type. Is that it? Yeah. Rising tides. raises. All I think this is a riding tides type of situation. A tide. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that like the more people that get into this, the better, the more like mainstream it'll be, the more legitimate it'll be. And I think that, that just good things will happen. Yeah. 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 So, um, should we go back to normal podcast mode and do our thing of the week? Yeah, let's go. (laughs) Might as well. Let's do thing of the week. (laughs) Okay. So my thing of the week is by far thermochromic ink. And I even said it correctly this time. You did. You didn't say thermochromatic. (laughs) So our video for that was released a few days ago. Um, and, I'm just looking around all we have over it the place. Right here. Yeah, we so have if the controller. So if, if you haven't seen the video, we um, turned our controller into a mood ring using thermochromic ink. It's amazing. Uh, it is so crazy oh. to me that the magic of mood rings can just be like used by anyone I and know. put on anything. It's I like, know. what the heck? I could have a thermochromatic microphone. I could have a thermochromatic like start, remote. Start, or, start I, I, yeah, I do. Thermochromatic oh, again. Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did do it to our remote also. We did do it to our remote. But it's it's such it's such an interesting accessible science thing that yeah. I thought was outside of our reach, but it's not. Yeah, it, it is super cool and very addicting to It's play very with addicting. This I just like controller. walk through our desk and I pick up. It's an Xbox 360 controller that we applied it to for those of you who haven't seen it and who are listening to it and not watching. Yes, we're just like petting it in adoration right now. Also <laughs> okay. because our fingerprints show up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my thing of the week is, is it a new series or did we just newly discover it? It's newly discovered. It's actually not that new. <laughs> okay. So the Not That New series um, on the Bon Appetit channel. You guys have heard me talk about the Bon Appetit channel before. Because it's so of, great. I love Claire and I love Brad. It, but there's this series that they did that involved a, like a larger group of people on the yeah. team. Um, and it's called Make It Perfect or Making Perfect? Mm. Making, Making Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> And it's it's where the it's like a five or six or some number part series where they try to make the perfect pizza. Evan just held up a six. Okay, <laughs> six part series where they try to make the perfect pizza and they divide up each of the tasks between the people. So um, the first step is making the dough, and Claire has to figure out how to make the perfect dough, and she goes and is taught by these professional pizza dough makers and it kind of continues for each part of the series but it's also just like hilarious and it's great production value but the thing that but still i love holding yeah. that like youtube vibe yeah they, they, they strike such a good balance and i'm so excited for the future of the platform like because i know a lot of people fear companies coming in but when but bon, bon appetit, appetit just like does it so they, they, well. just, they just get it they hire the right people they let them have the freedom they let like good content be made yeah. And it just makes me hopeful. Yeah. And they don't over polish it. They just like enable people to travel to Italy and yep. like spend time and money on the perfect pizza sauce. Yeah. I mean, like looking through the talk that we just gave, they're doing all the things very well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> In terms of like consistency and. Yes. Like, bon Appetit probably went to our talk at Maker Fair. Probably. Had, yeah. <laughs> but like, I guess it's just like I, I see a lot of good things in what they do and it's really exciting yeah but yeah yeah, it's an awesome series we'll link to it it's our we're in the middle of it right now i think we're on episode three and usual podcast will resume next monday where we have the topics and the games games and story times and all of the fun things that you guys like and we really appreciate you guys um listening and guys share this around i don't want this to just get hidden away or anything like that share this This one specifically yeah share this one in particular like this episode you know, wherever you think might work best, but like share it on all of your socials, 
on any websites that you think might be interested because I feel like this information in its entirety doesn't get shared often. Mm -hmm. And I think that like the whole story is so much more important than just like a single like tip or hack or whatever, yeah. especially the beginning part of this. I think that more people might need to hear the foundational stuff that we talked about. So yeah, please and thank you. Please and thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. We'll see you guys next week.